Bibles, go ahead and take them out and turn to the book of Colossians. Uh, The book of Colossians, we're continuing our Rooted series that we've been in walking through this short book. Uh, Just four chapters. Again, if you've never read an entire book of the Bible, this is a great one to start in. Four chapters. You can read it in like 20 minutes if you sit down and just read the whole thing. But but Paul, who is a, a follower of Jesus Christ, an apostle of Jesus Christ, wrote this to a church And basically what he's trying to communicate is that Jesus is not just a part of your Christian life. Jesus is not just a part of your spirituality, that Jesus is everything. That Jesus is preeminent. That's the word, the preeminent over all, every area of our life that he is to be Lord. And so in the first couple of chapters, he lays out a lot of, a lot of doctrine and a lot of theology, teaching. And then he gets real pa- practical starting in chapter three. And we've been walking through some of these practical steps, who we are supposed to be, who we are not supposed to be in Christ. And he goes a little bit deeper today. He gets more specific and he begins to talk about relationships, specifically marriage. Or for those of you who like Princess Bride, marriage. (laughs) Marriage is something that many struggle through. Marriage was created by God not to be something that is average or ordinary, but is something that God created to be extraordinary. Marriage is meant to be a gift and marriage is meant to be a blessing. Now, like every relationship, it, it has its ups and downs. There are the times when it is, it is excellent, and there are times that, that you are just deciding to stay married. And, and probably today, whether you're joining us online or you're here in the room, we, we have a little bit of everything. Some of you didn't know coming to church today that we were going to be talking about marriage, but your marriage is literally falling apart. Some of you are here today and you're saying, listen, I've walked through that in my marriage, but praise God, he's brought us to a place where where it is extraordinary today. I think back to my own marriage. I've been married 27 years. I know that that's hard for you to believe. I I was married when I was 10. Um, (laughs) But Becky and I have been married for 27 years. and, And I've joked before, though not joking, that it's, you know, about 22 of the happiest years of my life. So 27 years, 22 of the happiest years of my life. Early on, Becky and I did get married very young. I was 20 years old, which blows my mind because I have a 17-year-old son now. To think that that would even be around the corner for him is crazy. But I was 20 years old. And here's what I know about a 20-year-old young man. They are selfish and immature. That, That was me on steroids. So, so here I am coming in this relationship with Becky. Uh, she is a year older than I am. So she finished school in four years. I finished school in five years, which meant that I had two years left of school when we were married. So she is out trying to support us, making a living. You know what I'm doing? Goofing around, still acting like I'm in college. So you have this immature, selfish 20-year-old, and and you have Becky trying to figure out marriage and praise God that both of us come from situations where our parents are still married to this day. Divorce was not something that we even considered, even though honestly, we didn't like each other at that point. It was years later that we learned to love each other. And it was something that we just decided to do because we didn't like each other. We chose to love each other. Now, here's really the reason why we struggled. Neither of us were at a place in our relationship with Jesus that we should have been. And so as God began to transform our hearts individually, as our relationships with Christ began to grow and our focus was on Him, God used that to bring the two of us together. And now it is, it is the greatest. We still struggle sometimes. She still gets upset with me sometimes and rightly so. But it is the greatest gift outside of salvation that God has given me is my wife, Becky. And so Paul writes here and he, he talks about marriage, just two verses. This isn't a big section of scripture we're going to look at, just two verses. And Paul says that wives should submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, when you read that, especially in the context of today's world, anytime you see the word submit, we push back. 
It, it is the Texan in us. It is the libertarian in us. It is the independent streak that so many of us have that we don't want to submit to anything. And so when you're talking about marriage, and Paul says this over and over, he talks about in Ephesians, we'll talk about just a minute, he talks about it here. Wives, submit to your husbands. There's just an automatic like, no, we're going to stop right there. But just trust me, just stick with me on this as we look at this, because Paul's words on marriage here are shocking. But we have to make sure that we back up. And this is what's so important uh, about reading God's Word, that we don't just take one verse and build everything about one, around one verse, but that there's context, that we look at what he talks about after that. We look at what he talks about before that. And, and so as we look at the book of Colossians, Paul is talking about the fact that Jesus is preeminent overall, including our marriages. That he doesn't just want to make you a new creation, that he wants to transform our marriages. And if you think back to last week, if you were with us, kind of to set up what we're talking about, this helps us kind of swallow the pill of submission when he says that we're to be compassionate, kind, humble, meek, patient, forgiving as Christ forgave us, and above all, loving. So that's, that's just general relationships between believers. But if, if that is the backdrop for marriage, maybe I'll listen a little bit to what Paul has to say here. And so he sets the table again, verse 18, wives submit, he doesn't say obey. If you look a, bit, a little bit later on after verse 19, he's gonna talk about relationships with our kids. He's gonna talk about slaves and masters and he uses the word obey there. But he doesn't use the word obey here. He uses the word submit to your husbands as is fitting the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, that is a radical concept in this day. Because basically within the marriage context, every rule was for the wife and how she was to live and how she was to serve her husband. The husband basically had no responsibilities, no obligations to his wife. A wife in this day was almost like a pet, except she had kids. And that was the context. And Paul here radically says, no, 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 no. There, there are standards for you as husbands. And it's that you love your wives. That was such a, a foreign, radical concept for them. So submission, not obeying and loving your wife. God intended marriage to reflect the Trinity. The Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Think about the makeup of that. It's three in one. All are God. God the Father, God. God the Son, God. God the Holy Spirit, God. But there is submission and hierarchy there. There is God the Father. And we see that God the Son submits His will to God the Father. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is like, oh man, the cross is coming. It's in front of me. God the Father, if there's any other way... If there's a plan B that I don't know about, let me know right now, but not my will, but yours be done. I'm going to submit to the authority of God the Father. Jesus said, I'm leaving and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be a helper. So you have the Holy Spirit, which is also God, submitting to the Holy Spirit. So there's a hierarchy and submission within the Trinity. So, so let's just talk a minute, and I just want to break this down, and we're going we're to talk to the wives for a minute, we're going to talk about the husbands for a minute. Some of you are not married, I understand that. Maybe you have a desire to be married one day, so hopefully these are things that you will begin to ponder and consider and pray about as you think about a future spouse and the type of person that you want to spend the rest of your life with. If you've already walked through a marriage and it didn't go so well, maybe ended in divorce, and you have a desire to maybe be married again, again, that we would look at this as, as guidance for how we, we might can avoid some of the pitfalls that, that led to the ending of our first marriage. So, so as we look at this, let's just talk for a minute to, to the wives. It says the wives are to submit to their husbands, they're to help their husbands. He says, as is fitting to the Lord. Now, a couple of things as you look at this, first of all, all of the Christian life is about submission and authority. 
All of the Christian life is about submission and authority. We submit as followers uh, of Jesus Christ to God. We are called as followers of Jesus Christ to submit to those who are put in authority over us, to all government officials. That's locally, that's in our state, that's in our nation, that they have been placed in those positions by God for our good. Whether we like them or not, we are called to, to allow them to be in their places of authority and to submit to their leadership. We see within the structure of the church that there, are, that there are elders to lead the church. There is a structure of authority within the church and submission. And we also see that husbands are called to lead their wives and, and that wives are to submit to their husbands. Now, if you're like, hey, especially wives, I'm cool with submitting to Jesus, <laughs> but I'm not cool with submitting to my husband then your issue is not really your husband, your issue is with Jesus and you're not truly submitting to him. Because this is how God has laid out, there is a, a hierarchy and a structure that God lays out for our good. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse three, it says, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is who? Christ. So there's submission, there's authority there. The head of the wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. So you see submission and authority all throughout scripture, all the Christian life is submission to authority. And listen to this, watch this. Nobody is saved without submission. I realize that we really like to hold on to our independence and our choice. And maybe some of us think that we can come to Jesus and just kind of thumb our nose at him and go, listen, Jesus, I'll take your salvation, but I won't take your lordship. Like we have a say in that. Think about this. Nobody is saved without submission. I submit to Christ as Lord. He is over all. That's exactly what Paul is communicating all throughout the book of Colossians. The reason that submission for the wife is difficult is because of sin. Did, did you know that the Bible actually talks about that? There, there, there is an order to how God created things. So let's just go back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18. It said, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And I love this verse because basically he's looking at the man and he's just kind of feeling sorry for us guys. Like, if I leave him by himself, it's just not going to be good. I, I, I need to create a helper, and I love it, fit for him. In every way, God created the woman. In every one of our weaknesses, in every area of our needs, God created woman as a fit in every way for man. We needed a helper. Now, ladies, to be called a helper is a good thing. You're in good company because the, the other helper that we read about in Scripture is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send a helper. So, so God looked down at man. He's like, he's kind of pitiful. He needs a helper. I'm going to send a wife. I don't want them to live the Christian life alone. I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit. And so that's how God created things to be. But what happened? Sin entered the world. And after the fall, we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. And a lot of women are like, amen. Yeah, that happened. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So understand this verse is describing the destruction that happened within the marriage because of sin, because of the fall. That God created a hierarchy that, that, that he created woman to be a helper for the man, for the man to, to lead his wife. And what takes place because sin has entered the world is no longer does the wife willingly in the flesh want to submit to her husband, but she, it says, wants her desire is contrary to him. In other words, she wants to rule over him. And the result of the fall for the man is that he wants to rule 
over her. He wants to lord over her. That, that's the, 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 uh, the, the stereotype of the guy that's just kind of a jerk and woman, get me this. And that, you know, that kind of obnoxiousness that in the flesh, because of the fall, that the woman does not want to s- submit to her husband. And the man wants to lord, rule, dominate his wife. That, that's the effects of the fall. Now, let's talk just a second about what submission does not mean. Because I I think there's just some stereotypes out there, even within the church of what submission, what we think submission means, but it really doesn't. So let's talk about a couple of things. Number one, submission is not for single women. Okay, this is not that every woman has to submit to every man. This is within the context of a marriage that a wife submits which is a choice, graciously to her husband. So if you're single, this is not saying that you are underneath men, that men are greater than you, that men are better than you, that you have to submit to every man. Submission does not apply outside of the home or the church, right? Within the home, within the context of the home, I submit to my husband as a, as a follower of Christ within the church. There is a hierarchy we submit to, to our husbands and to our church leadership within our church. But outside of those two contexts, this submission does not carry over. So, so it's within the home, it's within the church. Submitting is different than obeying. When God says that children should obey their parents, What is he saying? If they tell you to do something, do it. Right? If I I tell my boys, go clean your room, that's not a choice. I'm not asking them how they feel about it. I'm not asking them if they want to. I'm saying, go clean your room. Right? Submitting is a choice. That that is a a, a choice that, that each wife makes under the leadership of the Holy Spirit in obedience to God's word to submit. It it, it is not, again, something that she has to do. It's not obeying. Submission does not mean uh, that a wife is less valuable or intelligent or or, or competent. Now let's be honest right here, guys. In reality, 95% of the time, maybe 99, they're definitely more in all three of those categories. They're, they're more valuable. They're definitely more intelligent and, and a lot of times more competent. I think that's why God looked down on Adam by himself and just felt sorry for him and said, I got to bring a helper. So, so this is not saying that, that ladies in a marriage that you are less than your husband. Submitting doesn't mean that you're less in any of these areas. Matter of fact, in a lot of these areas, uh, you, you have a, a higher value. Submission does not mean that a wife cannot influence her husband. And all the wives are going, that's not even hard, right? I can influence my husband easy. There's a, there's a difference between influence and manipulation. Right? Manipulation uh, is a lot of times deceptive. It, it is not, is not truthful. Influence means that you understand your husband, you understand the makeup your, of your husband, you understand the personality of your husband, you understand the emotions of your husband, and you as a wise helper know how to come alongside and guide him down the correct path. So, so submission does not mean that you can't influence your husband, that it's just what he says goes all the time. You can definitely have influence on your husband. Some of the influences that a wife can have in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, talking about the husband. So you have a husband who is either lost or is, is walking away from the faith, that they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. In other words, if you have a husband and ladies, unfortunately, what happens a lot of the time is you're the spiritual leader of your home. And that's not how God created things to be, but your husband is passive. And he won't step into that area that God has called him to lead out in. Either he's passive spiritually or he's just lost. And so what Peter is saying here, by your conduct wives, by the way that that you love and lead and serve and help your husband, 
that they might be impacted and influenced in such a way that they come to Christ. By your actions, you can influence them. Submission is voluntarily given. It's not forcefully taken. Husbands, it's not for you to browbeat your wife and tell her how she's supposed to do what you tell her to do because the Bible says so. It's something that she voluntarily does out of submission to her heavenly father and the created order that God has for the marriage. Submission does not mean following a husband into sin. And just any way you want to go with this, if a husband is leading a wife into sin, whether it's sexually, whether it's in conduct and actions that are, that are not a becoming of a follower of Jesus Christ, submission doesn't mean I have to follow him into that. Submission does not mean domineering or overbearing. And I'm talking about that as far as the wife, that she's domineering or overbearing towards her husband, that she does it uh, emasculate her husband. A lot of TV shows have this stereotype of this fat, dumb husband that, that sits in his chair and eats donuts. It's the Homer Simpson stereotype, right? And that the wife is basically domineering and leading over everything because the hu husband's too dumb to lead. That, that, that's not submitting. Submitting is, is saying, I'm going to allow him to lead our family. Submission means treating a husband with respect, especially around the kids. Now, over in Ephesians, and we're going to look at that in just a minute, it says that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, and that wives are to respect their husbands. Now, it's interesting if you think about the, the gut level needs that a man has and that a woman has within the marriage context. A woman needs to feel loved and know that she's loved. A man, to be able to step into that leadership role that God has outlined in Scripture, needs to feel respected. Ne needs to feel like and have confidence that he can lead effectively, that he can fulfill the role that God has given him. That means that, that wives, if your husband is, is not leading, that you don't belittle him, especially around the kids. So, so whether it's the husband or the wife, just understand this. There's a, a really good chance that your kids are going to treat their spouse exactly the way you treat yours. For some of you, that's not a good thing. That they are, they are watching. I'm watching to see how mom lovingly respects and helps dad. I'm watching to see how dad lovingly supports and serves mom. And when they get into their future marriages, that they'll mirror what they've seen in their parents. So submission means treating a husband with respect, especially around the kids. Now, husbands, let's talk about you. A couple of things. Husbands, you're to love and cherish your wife. Now, understand, when, when, when Paul writes in Ephesians, when Paul writes in Colossians, he says, husbands, love your wives. What, what that is there, that, that love, that's agape love. That is a choice. So, some of us have, have this idea that love is supposed to be this gooey feeling. And when it goes away, I don't have any responsibility anymore. I, I can't tell you how many people have come into my office, couples, and they're, 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 their marriage is falling apart. And, and maybe one of them wants a divorce. And this is what they say. I deserve to be happy. I just want to be happy. I want out of this so I can go be happy. Can I just tell you right now, number one, that is a lie from Satan. Paul says here that, that love is a choice. And it starts with the husband. He says, wives, you respect your husbands. Husbands, you don't have a choice. You love your wives. Even if she's not reciprocating, even if she's not respecting you, even if she's not doing all the things that are outlined in Scripture, you are called to love your wife and to cherish your wife, to, to make her feel like outside of Christ, she is the most valuable thing in the world to you, that that is a choice, that we choose to do that. Men, if you, if you hear that and your response is, that, that's difficult. 
Let me just give you a little homework for 30 days. Choose to love your wife and choose to cherish her. Even if there's no feelings behind it, I'm just going to love her and I'm just going to cherish her. And see what God does in your life and in your marriage in 30 days. Paul understood this. He understood that the gooey feelings and the butterflies and all of those things weren't always going to be present in your marriage. For the first five years of my marriage, Becky and I had to choose to love each other. And there have probably been times since then that we have to choose to love each other. But that's exactly what Paul says. Husbands, love your wives. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, that's easy to look at that and go, okay, so what he's saying is I need to be willing to die for my wife because that's what Jesus did for the church. He died for the church. I need to be willing to die for my wife. That, that's chivalrous, right? How about this? Don't just be willing to die for your wife. Be willing to live for your wife. What does Philippians say about Jesus and, and how he thought of the church and how he, he thought of us? He didn't consider equality with God something great. He made himself nothing. He became a what? A servant to the point of death. So don't just look at this Ephesians and say, I just need to be willing to die for my wife. No, you need to be willing to live for your wife. You need to be willing to, to serve your wife. Loving leadership, service unto death. So what does it mean for a husband to love his wife? Let's, let's put love into action. Give you some practical steps. There's a difference between being the head and being the boss. I think a lot of men think that, that being the head means that they're the boss, that they're supposed to lord over their wives. Being the head, Jesus was the head. Again, what did he do? He lovingly served. Now, I've, I've never been a wife. I've never been a woman. So, so forgive me if I'm stepping into to your realm, ladies. And if I'm off, just let me know. But I haven't met a woman yet in a marriage context that wasn't willing to submit to a husband who loved her and served her. Men, we are called to love and serve our wives. A husband will get the love that he gives to his wife. Now, there's an idea out there that marriage, because it's two people, that marriage is 50-50. I feel like all I do is give and give and give, and I don't give anything back, and I'm giving my 50%, and she's not giving her 50%. As followers of Jesus Christ, within the context of marriage, each one of us is called to give 100%. If there's reciprocation in any way, that's just a bonus. But, but this is not a give and take. I give 50 and they give 50 and that equals 100. I give 100 and, and prayerfully she gives 100. It's 200. Man, that's awesome. <laughs> but as a husband, you will get the love many times that you give to your wife. If your wife is cold and standoffish, maybe you're cold and standoffish. If you love and serve and sacrifice for your wife over time, God will work in her heart. Whether she's saved or not, she'll appreciate having a husband like that and will reciprocate that. Uh, Ephesians 5, 28, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Here's, here's the one I love. Loving a wife means making her life better with you than it could have been apart from you. Think about Jesus. My life is better because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Then my life would have been apart from Jesus Christ. I want to love my wife in such a way. I want to serve my wife in such a way that her life is better with me than without me. That's how we're called to love our wives. Loving your wife means friendship with her. There was a study done several years back and, and they asked women, this wasn't even a Christian study, what is the thing that you desire most from your husband? Now I realize guys, when we hear that question, we think sex. You know what they wanted? Friendship. 
Your, your wife wants to be friends with you. And then he goes on, not only are we to love them and cherish them and sacrifice for them, it says, do not be harsh to them. Do not mistreat them. Do not dominate them. So how do we do that, guys? How, how are we harsh with our wives? A couple of things. One, we can be emotionally distant. This is what this looks like. We think, husbands, that our job is just to provide for our family. That we're supposed to go to work and we're supposed to make a living and make sure they have a roof over their head and the kids can have nice things. And if we do that, then we have fulfilled our obligation as a husband. But that's only the beginning. Many times we do that and we come home, we want to be left alone, we don't want to talk to anybody, we want to sit in our chair, we want to watch TV or do whatever it is that you like to do. Don't be disturbed. And we become emotionally distant from our wives. That, that's a form of, of harshness. Don't be abusive verbally, emotionally, or physically. You, you are meant to cherish your wife, to, to love her as your own body. Men, you don't put a hand on your wife. There is never a time that you are ever, ever allowed to touch your wife in that way. Verbally, you're to build her up and cherish her, not to belittle her, not to break her down, not to talk about the way she used to look or any of those things. All of those things crush the spirit of your wife. Emotionally, physically, verbally, we're to never, ever ever be abusive to our wives. Never publicly humiliate your wife in front of other people. N never do it in private either, but never publicly humiliate your wife. Remember the difference between in your relationship, a sin and a mistake. We, we don't react the same way to those things. Sometimes just honest mistakes happen. My wife doesn't always pay attention to where she's driving. Every once in a while, she runs into things, right? That's not a sin, that's a mistake. Now in my flesh, I want to blow up and act like it's the worst thing in the world. But the reality is it was just a mistake. She didn't mean to. She doesn't drive around going, let me run into stuff. It's an accident. Treat, treat sin differently than mistakes. And even in sin, what are we called to do? Forgive as Christ forgave us and to love. Your wife needs a husband, not a roommate. She needs someone to love her. She needs someone to serve her. She needs someone to cherish her. Don't be boring. That, that's a form of harshness. That you're just kind of a bump on a log. That you're never romantic. That you don't ever want to spend time with her. That you're boring. Harshness towards your wife will affect your relationship with God. First Peter talks about that in verse, I mean, chapter 3 and verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs. That's talking about physically the weaker vessel. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers not be, may not be hindered. Did you know showing harshness towards your wife actually puts a barrier up between yourself and God? That actually your, your prayers aren't being answered? Have you ever thought about that? So there, there's definitely a, a negative spiritual component here towards our wives. Again, in Christ, we are new creations. God wants your marriage to reflect what he's done in your life. The old is gone. The new has come. God's desire for your marriage is not average. God's desire for your marriage is not ordinary. God's desire for your marriage is extraordinary. God wants the best for your marriage. And here's the deal this morning. Here's what I know to be true. A lot of your marriages are struggling. And even for some of you here, in your mind, you've already decided our marriage is too far gone. God can't fix this. That's like saying that someone is too lost to be saved. You understand that God is in the miracle business. That, that when the angel came to Mary and said, I know you've never been with a man, but you're going to become pregnant. That nothing is impossible 
with God. Can I hold out hope to you today? That God can fix your marriage, but God wants to fix your heart first. How God can work in your marriage is that you make a decision that God is going to be preeminent in every single area of your life. And that you pray for your spouse that they would come to that place as well, that God would be preeminent in every area of their life. And as you both move towards God, it's amazing how God brings the two of you together. Now, some of you need to go to Christian counseling. Some of you need a little bit more than just a sermon, one sermon on Sunday morning. It's going to be a process. But go back to what Paul talked about before we even got to the marriage relationship. We're to be kind. We're to be considerate. We're to be humble. We're to be meek. We're to forgive each other. And above all, we're to love. What if, again, homework. You didn't know you are coming to school. What if you just practice those things in your home this month? I'm just going to practice these things towards my husband. I'm going to practice these things towards my wife, even if it's just discipline. I'm just making myself do it. I don't want to do it. I'm just making myself do it. Here's what I believe. God will do something miraculous in your marriage. God will do something miraculous. God doesn't just want to transform you. God wants to transform your marriage. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for this relationship called marriage. And God, in, in, in some miraculous way, the, you, you tie marriage into our relationship with the church and Christ's relationship with the church as the bride and the groom. And, and God, the, the marriage is something that, that you created for your glory. That, that ultimately our, our marriages can, can be a witness. Ultimately our marriages are, are to glorify you, God. And, and Lord, I pray today for every marriage, whether they're watching online, whether they're in the room, that is struggling, that is hurting. God, I pray that they would hear hope today. God, I pray for, for healing today. I pray for, for restoration today. Lord, I pray for those that, that maybe their marriage didn't work out. We're, they're already kind of past this. And maybe there's some guilt. And, and Lord, I just pray that, that, Father, there'd be no condemnation today, that they would be able to, God, just lift that up to you. And, and Father, that they would understand your love and mercy in their lives. And, and God, maybe as, as they move forward and, and hope to be remarried, God, that these are principles from God's word that they'll apply to their lives and to their future marriage and also to the person, the future spouse that maybe you have for them. God, I pray that our marriages, Lord, that maybe they're not on the rocks. Maybe it's just kind of stale. We've just kind of got used to each other. God, that that's not even what you call us to. You, you call us to the extraordinary. Lord, I, th I thank you in my life for, for Becky. I thank you that she loves you. I thank you that she wants to submit and serve me, even though in so many levels she's way sharper than I am. Thank you for the, the helpmate that she is. God, help me to be the husband that I'm called to be. Help, help me not to be short. Help me not to be harsh. Help me to love my wife and help me to serve my wife. And the, the times that I don't feel like it, help me just to decide I'm going to love my wife unconditionally the same way that Christ loves me. So, Father, I pray for marriages today. God, I pray for salvation today. Ultimately, a marriage is never going to be what you created to be apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if there's anyone watching, if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know Jesus personally as their Savior, God, I, I pray that that would be the first thing that happens. God, that your Holy Spirit would draw them to yourself, that they would see that, that they need to be saved from their sin and, and their Savior is Jesus. So God, as your Holy Spirit is in this place, as you're working in our hearts, God, I pray that we would just be obedient right now to you and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.